science is evolutionary, including the study of paleontology. Dinosaurs have captured our imaginations for roughly the last two centuries. Each fossil discovery creates just as many questions as it does answers. Our guest today is an educator, author of several books, and winner of many awards in paleontological sciences. Welcome to Celebrate Michigan, the show produced on the campus of Madonna University. I'm Chris Benson, and we're so excited here today to have our guest, Joseph Kotel, or Paleo Joe, to everyone he meets. Thank you for joining us, Paleo Joe. My pleasure, it's great to be here. <laughs> so what led you to paleontology? Well, I've always been a nature freak. I love nature, and I lived in New York State on a block that was one mile each leg of that block. I was the only kid that lived on that block, so I was always out in the woods looking for things. I collected bird feathers and, and rocks and minerals and plants and leaves, and the one thing I found that was really exciting were these things called fossils. When I got my first book on fossils called The Golden Guide to Fossils, and I read that book from cover to cover, and I learned about these wonderful things we call fossils. So started digging in the neighborhood and led to digging all over the world. All where, over the world. Where have you gone to do fossil digs? I've done digs in Europe and in the Czech Republic, but I also do a lot of digs here in the United States. I dig dinosaurs in Utah, uh, Wyoming, Montana, South Dakota. I dig trilobites in New York, down in Ohio. I dig fossil plants in Illinois, and I dig prehistoric fossil fish, again, in another part of Wyoming. You mentioned the word trial bites. What, what, it, what are those? Trilobites are the ancient saltwater sea creatures that crawled on the ocean floor. They were kind of like the uh, ocean's vacuum cleaners. They'd, uh, they're, they're related to lobsters, crabs, and crayfish. Oh my gosh. So you mentioned um, all over the United States and all over the world. How about here in Michigan? What have you done here? Gosh, Michigan is so fossil rich. Really? Um, See, I wouldn't think that. Oh, absolutely. The area between Alpena and Traverse City, I call that the Golden Crescent. And we were once the bottom of a shallow saltwater tropical sea. And and what we find here is creatures that lived in those oceans. Uh, thanks to the last couple of ice ages we had, the uh, snow and ice came across and scraped away all the topsoil and exposed the bottom of the coral reef that was around so many millions of years ago. Wow. So I've never been on a fossil dig. I, I've seen it depicted in movies. Um, is it like they show in the movies? What would it, what would it look like if I were here and saw you doing one in Michigan? Uh, here in Michigan, it's a little bit different. Uh, here, we do a lot of surface collecting. The fossils are literally laying on the surface. There are ditches up in Alpena that they've broken through bedrock, and you're actually walking down into that coral reef, and there are fossils everywhere. Dinosaurs, I do collect dinosaurs. I do dig dinosaurs. That's a little bit different. That's a little closer to what you saw in Jurassic Park. Okay, so you, you teed this up for the next question, right? <laughs> so talking about movies, um, just how they, I'll say two things, how they depict paleontology, how they depict or reenact dinosaurs. What, what are your thoughts on those things? It's really interesting. Uh, it's great entertainment. I love it. But mm -hmm. as far as the movies go, how close are they to reality? Not very close. Um, the beginning of the Jurassic Park 1, when they're down on the ground with that brush and, and brushing away the, the dirt, that's about as close as you get. After that, it's all fantasy. Um, we do a lot of work, a lot of research, and it takes a lot of time. It doesn't happen overnight. Uh, sometimes it takes weeks and months to remove one bone. It took four years to remove one uh, femur from one of my dinosaurs. Four years to get out of the ground. Uh, but anyway, the, to go back to the to the question, uh, the, the the dinosaurs are depicted for Hollywood. They're much larger than they actually were. Uh, it's again great, exciting, you know, television, but it, it's not really uh, real, realistic. So I think of some of the great um, explorers and fossil finders. Of course, Indiana Jones comes to mind. And I'm not sure, was he a paleontologist? Uh, he was an archaeologist. An archaeologist, OK. So is how what was your path to get you there so he became like a professor and then you know you know this belongs in a museum and those kind of things what was your path to wow. getting to be a paleontologist well, it, it started because of my love for fossils and i studied as much as i could before i went to college i ended up going to college uh, in niagara university in new york um, and i studied uh, education there that's why i'm such a decent educator uh, but after that i went in the military for eight years i spent eight years in the army uh, i didn't collect fossils i wanted to be the best soldier i could possibly be when i got out the Army went right back into paleontology. I've, did, I've done work with Casper College in Wyoming. Uh, I've got graduate work from Florida Institute of Technology and a lot of time out in the field and, and working with fossils. So would you say it was, you always wanted to do this and you kept, you just kept going in that direction? My entire life, from the time I was 10 years old, yep. How important do you think paleontology is to today's world? Maybe some people might think, ah, that's like the past. Well, Why should I care? 
It's really crazy. I don't want to get political, but we got to learn from the past. If we don't learn from the past, we're doomed to repeat it. And unfortunately, you know, I'm digging creatures that are extinct. We've had lots of extinctions over time, and these creatures uh, just didn't make it. And mm -hmm. we've got to make sure we take care of our earth. And we learn as much as we can about these creatures. I mean, you walk up on something like this, you know, there's nothing alive on earth today that resembles this. This was a, a bone of a triceratops. Nothing on earth resembles that. Why? You know, what happened to them? Why do they look the way they did? Those kind of things. And do you think that with, again, the way the climate is changing and things are happening, does that make your, your finding of these sadly easier or harder? You know, um, it, the weather, uh, weather, Mother Nature is one of our best paleontologists. Because of the rains we have out in the deserts, because these are all found in deserts, because of the rains and the winds we get out there, that removes a lot of the overburden, the stuff that's on top of these, to make it a lot easier for us to find them. Mm -hmm. So again, Mother Nature is one of our best paleontologists. She shows us where these things are. Yeah, for sure. Well, I can't wait in the next segment for us to be able to talk about all the cool things you've brought because I'm dying to hear more about this yep. and where you found it and those kind of things. But we do have to take a quick break. Uh, I know you're not going anywhere. When we get right back, we're going to talk more to Paleo Joe about dinosaurs, fossils, and books. Oh, my! And how that has led him to his become an author. Stay tuned. We'll see you in just a few. shelter here I come and no I'm not crazy or emotionally damaged that's a stereotype I just belong to a total loser I'm a good dog so if you want a pet adopt and if you see Randy tell him he dropped his wallet this hard? It's no wonder 7,000 students drop out every school day. Visit BoostUp.org and help kids in your community stay in school. My name's Reggie. Just recently, my wife and I took in her sister's children. And we already had four, so I went from becoming a family man to a man with a bigger family. <clears throat> now, you can't eat love, so I don't know how I'm going to feed them tonight. How was that, Reggie? I think I look more like Denzel. That's cold, man. Play a role in ending hunger. Visit feedingamerica.org slash hunger and find your local food bank. Welcome back to Celebrate Michigan. I'm Chris Benson, and I'm here with paleontologist and author Paleo Joe. We have to talk about these items you brought. I mean, yep. I'm sitting like just feet away from something that is how old? Uh, this one's about 65 million years old. Okay. Give or take two million years. Tell me about this. You mentioned it's from a Triceratops. Yep, this is a Triceratops vertebra. This is actually a, a vertebra that comes from the uh, thoracic section, the, the body section of the of the Triceratops. Down here, this big chunky part, that's the uh, centrum. This is where all the, the vertebra kind of stack up against that. In the middle, there's that hole. That's where the neural arch where all the, the spinal cord goes through. One thing that's missing from it is there's a central process, the spinous process right here. That broke off. Uh, probably before fossilization, it's gone, we, we couldn't recover it. Then these are two other processes. Uh, this bone actually, I had to break it in order to clean it. Um, there's a, a long process of cleaning these bones. It's not just you know wash it off and put it in a museum, there's a long process. Sometimes it takes weeks and months to clean these bones. And this one was so badly damaged that I actually had to break it right here at the neural arch and I had to break these things off in order to clean it so I could glue it back together and display it. 
So tell me the story of when you found this. Do you remember and where? Well, this is uh, this is from South Dakota. Um, all the bones I find, for, for me, it's like Christmas every day. You never know what you're going to find. And I've been finding these bones. You just kind of, again, it's kind of like the, the Jurassic Park movie. You're down on your hands and knees or you're down on your stomach using a paintbrush to brush away the dirt and sediment. Uh, there is hard rock. Uh, fo fossil digging as well. Down in Utah where I dig long neck dinosaurs, there we use an actual jackhammers to break through the rock to oh get to gosh. the bones. And the way we can tell that there are bones there is there's a color difference between the bone and the sediment around mm -hmm. it. So every every bone is different, but in the, in the areas in South Dakota, we just use a paintbrush to brush away. Once we do that, let me get into this one too. Yeah, because <laughs> I'm like, what is that? Once we, this is also a vertebra. This is from the Edmontosaurus. And what we do is we first start by, when we find a bone, we start to brush off the top it to see where it is. And then after that, uh, we dig a trench all the way around the bone. Uh, that trench is to help expose the bone. We dig it down about six inches. Uh, once we get that all done, then we take tin foil and put tin foil over top of the bone. That holds the bones together so they don't break away anymore. And actually, you can see that they're, they're pretty loose. Uh, these bones would fall apart and, and turn to dust if we didn't take care of them. So we, again, put the tin foil over top. Then we take plaster of Paris and soak burlap strips in it. That's kind of what you see on TV too. We put the burlap strips over top of the bone. We make what's called a plaster jacket. Jacket. The jacket's nice and hard. It protects the bone so it doesn't break anymore. Uh, we have the whole thing encapsulated. We go back to the laboratory. We cut it open and start to prep the bones. Okay, so the question is why? Why collect these things? Why search for them? Uh, you know, I've collected fossils all over the country, all over the world, and people ask me why do I do it? Um, because I want people to see these things. I actually have three traveling museum exhibits. One is the Fossils of the Michigan Basin, which actually opens this, this end of this week. One is Dinosaur Prep Lab, where I talk about preparing dinosaurs, and one's Trial by Treasures. I don't want these things in my house. I want the public to enjoy them. When you go to a museum, 95% of what they have in their collection is in the basement. You never see it. So for me, to get these things out on the road, that's what's most important. Educate the public what was there back then. You know, We have creatures right now that are similar to what we had during prehistoric times. They're different species, but they're very, very similar. My job is to you know, educate people, let them know what's out there. What I hear coming through everything you're saying is that you're trying to make this history very accessible to a lot of different people, whether it's through you know it being right here where you can touch it, or um, I noticed you've got a lot of books here. You're an author, so how talk about your books and, and how that helps well, bring this to that maybe was children. Kinda, that was kind of cool because I. I had a publisher that was up in Traverse City. He saw some of the things that I do. He went to my website and he saw that I, I do kid programs, I do adult programs, universities, colleges, I do fossil digs. And he said, you know, you do so much for kids, why don't you write some children's books? And I thought, man, that is a really great idea. So I decided to write a series of chapter books. They're dinosaur mystery and adventure books. Each book's a different creature, different mystery or adventure. And the kids are the heroes. I'm the guy, I'm the guy that makes all the mistakes. I'm the comic foil. The kids are the heroes of the stories. So that, again, gets the kids excited about paleontology, and there's real paleontology in every book. The stories are fantasy, but the paleontology is real. And from that, I started doing some adult books too, because mm -hmm. you know, got to train the adults as sure. well. I've got a book on trilobites, trilobites in North America, uh, trilobites, the ancient saltwater sea creatures. Uh, you buy a book on fossils, you'll see trilobites from all over the world, but nothing from North America. Mm -hmm. This is a book that tells you all about the trilobites that are found in North America. I just finished writing another book um, called Beginner's Guide to Fossils of Michigan. Um, this is a book that actually, um, I guess I, I just recently wrote it, but this is a field trip guidebook. Tells you whereabouts in the state of Michigan you go to find fossils. At the end of the book, it's got an identification guide that identifies some oh, of the fossils. Neat. So again, awesome. it's all there to educate people. Now, be, because we had COVID, we had a lot of people doing staycations, staying home, yeah. staying in Michigan. This would be a wonderful thing to get out and explore Michigan and see what Michigan has to offer. Sure, I understand you have podcasts as well. Yeah, uh, I've got a YouTube channel and I also do podcasts on my website. Websites paleojo.com, very simple. And on there, I've got all kinds of things. I've got teacher resources for teachers to look at. There's posters people can download. Um, there's uh, TV shows, radio shows. This this is gonna go on my podcast. Uh, so we got all kinds of things that, there, uh, educational stuff for uh, kids from grades, basically k kindergarten all the way through uh, college level. Mm -hmm. So all kinds of things on the website. Dinosaurs and um, these kind of adventures are so interesting to kids. Why do you think that is? You know, it, for kids, it's it's 
I don't want to say fantasy because these are not fantasy. These things are real. But for them, the, the, the excitement of, of learning about some magical giant creature, you know, Early on, when people first started finding dinosaur bones, like 5,000 years ago in China, there were no paleontologists, no scientists, geologists to tell them what they were. They came up with the myths and legends and stories of dragons. In the yeah. Middle Ages, when the English were digging coal to fire their furnaces in their homes, they found these giant bones in the ground. Nobody could tell them what they were. They came up with the myths and legends and stories of dragons. Dinosaurs are dragons. Dragons are dinosaurs. And I think that's why kids like some of these books. It's their, it fuels their imagination. And I'm sure adults like them, too, yeah, in that sense yeah. of adventure as well. That's true. So I understand you've also um, won a couple of awards. Mm -hmm. Would you care to tell us about that? Well, the first award uh, basically have been for my uh, endeavors in education. The first mm -hmm. award I won uh, from the Paleontological Research Institute in New York, uh, the Catherine Palmer Award. And again, that one was for um, er my early years, back in 2001, when I really started educating the public. And just recently, in 2021, I won an award, uh, the Charles Sternberg uh, Medal, uh, for my lifelong desire to educate the public for all my uh, uh, all the things that I've done to, to help the, educate the public so I won that one. Well congratulations on Thank that you. again it sounds like from what I can tell everything you're doing I can just feel that passion coming through you and also that desire again to educate to tell other people about what you're finding. Yeah. When I do school school programs the kids just soak the stuff up and I watch the teachers and you'll see the teacher's face just light up or they'll, their, their mouth will drop open they can't believe some of the things I'm saying. It brings it to life for them. It does. Well, it's time for another short break, but please stay with us because we're going to get a tease for what comes next in paleontology with Paleo Joe. So don't go anywhere. Stay tuned. We'll see you in just a few. What to expect when you're expecting? Like you? A teenager. Today, I'm going to show you how to teen-proof your home. First step, hide the car keys, preferably somewhere they would never look. Challenges will come up. Be ready for them. Hi, honey. Ready for them, Mom. You don't use mannequins in the mannequin challenge. You don't have to know it all to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same. <laughs> everywhere are finding ways to keep kids active and healthy. Works every time. Get ideas, get involved, get going at letsmove.gov. Welcome back to Celebrate Michigan. I'm Chris Benson and we're back in the studio with Paleo Joe to talk more about paleontology and the importance of it and relevance of it to us. So we were talking during the break and I mentioned, I feel like I've seen this in Michigan. So tell me about this rock. That's a piece of what's called hexagonaria coral. It's a coral that grew on the bottom of the ocean. You all might recognize it and call it a Petoskey stone. Okay. But it's not a Petoskey stone until oh. you slice it and polish it and charge people lots of money for it. Which I feel like I've paid. <laughs> Absolutely. Lots of money. And it's now Natural form it's called hexagonaria coral, but again, it's the Michigan State Stone, and yeah. So that's cool what we fossil. see. Ah, so when I go to the souvenir shop, that's what I can expect to see. Huh? Well, you'll expect to see the polished one. I don't think you'll ever see the rough one unless you go up fossil hunting. 
So when you're getting ready for these digs, how do you get ready for, for these projects? You know, I, I do a little bit of research. I try to find out uh, where people have gone before me um, because it's you don't just walk over the face of the earth and say, oh, I'm going to dig fossils right there. It's not the way it works. Mm -hmm. uh, we go where people have gone before us. Thomas Jefferson was a famous paleontologist. Really? He's got several things named after him. He loved paleontology. He's got the Jefferson mammoth, the Jefferson okay. sloth. You wow. know, all those things are named after him because he did like fossils. So we've been collecting fossils since the 17 and 1800s. So we kind of know where they are and we're never going to run out. Wow. Well, I know you brought some cool in-studio items today, but you also brought some pictures yep. for us. So we're going to take a look and just walk us through what we're going to be looking at here. Well, that's uh, some crazy guy laying down on the ground, and that's kind of <laughs> what I'm doing. Now, we don't have, we're out in the middle of the desert. This is in Utah. Uh, we don't have electricity out there. You can't walk up and plug a, a compressor into a rock, so we bring a generator. The generator generates electricity. Then we have an air compressor that compresses the air so we can use our air scribes, our air tools. That's kind of what I'm holding in my hand right there. Wow. In Utah, the rock is very hard. Uh, we can't just brush the dirt away like you saw in Jurassic Park there. We actually have to use those little mini jackhammers to <laughs> break apart the rock and get to the bones. Wow. It looks like painstaking work. It is. And then see that right there? That's a jumble of bones. Um, a lot of times when we find these things, we find them in the bo bottom of rivers. And the river, what it does, is it picks up the bones and kind of deposits them in the center or deposits them on a sandbar. Um, all the big bones kind of stay together. The little bones, the toes, the, the tail vertebra, the head, the neck, all kind of washes downstream. And what you're left with is the major part of the body. And right there, I've got both scapula, which are the, sho uh, the uh, uh, shoulder blades, uh, both scapula there. There's a couple of ribs hanging out there as well. So again, that's probably the top part of the body, the, the, the arms and, and the scapula. I love how casual you are about it. Like, yeah, there's some bones, there's a scapula <laughs> there, you know. This one right here, this is what we actually do. Um, if you've ever watched, uh, you know, a cop show, TV show about uh, detectives, we do actually use the same type of grid pattern. Uh, what we do is we actually lay the pattern down on the bones, we draw them out, we take pictures of them, we take uh, uh, compass headings, we do all kinds of scientific stuff to tell us more about those bones. How were they deposited? Were they deposited in the river? Are they all pointing in the same direction? What happened to them? Did somebody bite that bone? Were they eating it? You know, And that kind of stuff is told when we uh, start taking photographs and start drawing these things. Awesome. All the tools of the trade there, oh, too, huh? Yeah. And that right there is a, a paleontologist by the name of Mike Demick. He actually studies sauropods, the long neck dinosaurs. And the bones I've been working on there are from a long neck. Uh, that is just one scapula right there of a uh, long neck, just one of his shoulder blades. That looked incredibly heavy. It was very heavy, yeah. Mike and I struggled to get that thing down to the van. Yeah. Wow. So what was, I know probably it's like picking your favorite child, right? What was one of your most memorable digs? Oh, boy. Oh. They all are. They, uh, literally, they all are. Depends on what I'm digging. Uh, I was in Montana uh, digging in the dirt, in nice soft dirt, and I uncovered the uh, the rib bones of a tricer of, of a T-Rex. You know that that's everybody's joy yeah. is a T-Rex. Uh, just recently came back from South Dakota. Uh, with my daughter, actually Paleo Jen, my daughter's taken over after I'm gone. Um, took her out there, we found a bunch of Edmontosaurus bones, which is a duck bill dinosaur. I found parts of a Trionics turtle, which is a soft shell turtle. Um, the guy next to me found a beautiful Nanotyrannus tooth, which was rooted. Interesting thing there is most of T-Rex teeth we find are broken off because T-Rex are biting into bones and they're oh, breaking wow. off their teeth. But their teeth are constantly growing, constantly being replaced. So we found, we call it tooth draw. There are hundreds of teeth all over the place, T-Rex teeth. So, you know, whatever I'm digging, it's, it's really exciting. In New York, I dug up a double Delmonides trilobite, which was covered in pyrite, fool's gold. Oh, wow. Uh, gosh, it just goes on and on. Anything that really surprised you when you remember being on a dig and saying, oh my gosh? You know, not not on a dig. The digs are pretty simple. Mm -hmm. uh, you just dig up what's in the dirt. But when you start to prep them and clean them, sometimes you find some interesting things. Uh, recently, we were cleaning um, what's called a cystoid. It, it, long story, but it's a, it looks like a plant. It's actually an animal that's got waving fingers at the top. Mm -hmm. As it's being cleaned, underneath those arms, we found a starfish. So, oh. and it, that uh, fossils tell us stories. They always tell us stories. It tells us about a storm event, kind of like what's happening right in Florida right now. Mm -hmm. The hurricanes hit the water. They killed and destroyed the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. The hurricane hit the land and washed all this mud and slurry out into the lagoons and buried all these creatures. And then the creatures started to recover again. The ecosystem recovered. All of a sudden, the storms come in again and yeah. destroys the ecosystem. Fossils tell us stories. Wow.
And I know, um, tell us your website. Paleojoe.com. Okay. Uh, it's uh, P-A-L-E-O-J-O-E.com. Uh, lots of really great things there, lots of teacher resources, all sorts of stuff. I noticed that. I noticed that I could go on a dig. You've got digs I can sign up to go on. Tell yep, us about I've that. I've got, uh, every year I do about five digs up north, um, up to either Roger City or to Alpena. Uh, I take up to ten families up there at a time, and uh, we spend the day looking for fossils, and everybody just loves it. Uh, on the website you'll also see I've got exhibits. Matter of fact, one exhibit is opening October 7th uh, in Midland at the Midland Center for the Arts. It's going to be fossils of the Michigan Basin and a dinosaur prep lab where I'm going to be sitting in the museum cleaning fossils as the public walks by and talks to me. Wow. Usually you don't get a chance to do that. You'll see the prep lab is behind bulletproof glass, uh, but I'll be right out there talking to people about that. I've got another, and then, well, actually when it leaves the Center for the Arts in January, it's going to uh, Jackson, Michigan. From Jackson, it's going to Lapeer, and then it's going to uh, Muskegon for six months. So for the next two years, these exhibits are on the road where people can enjoy them. Yeah, bones are going to keep on rolling, right? Keep on rolling. Well, I know on your website there's so many, again, you mentioned that education is a really big piece yep. of this for you, and there's resources that look very accessible to parents or yep. children or even the novice. What yep. would you say to someone who's like, gosh, that sounds really interesting. I'd like to get into paleontology. You know, th we need paleontologists so bad. Almost any job you can think of, you can do that as a paleontologist. You guys out here in the studio, we need people to go out and photograph and document what we're doing out there. Mm -hmm. So these guys are learning mm -hmm. how to do that, and they can do it as paleontologists. Uh, there's paleogeneticists that are start, starting to research, you know, DNA of, of creatures. No DNA in this stuff, but yeah. watch out what's happening with mammoths. Uh, we're finding mammoth DNA. You know, we're trying to reverse engineer and create mammoths again. Um, Paleobiologists, uh, uh, paleo uh, entomologists study uh, insects. Paleo meteorologists study the weather. We need technicians that use uh, CT scanners because we can scan these bones and look inside. Uh, we scan the rocks to see what's in the rock. Yeah, I mean, there's so much to do out there as a paleontologist. So it's definitely not something from the past. You see it as something for the future. For the future. Paleo Joe, it has been a delight having you in the studio today and learning all about these various things. Thank my you pleasure. so much for being here. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's lots of fun. And I can't believe the time has ended already, yep. but it has. Thank you so much for tuning in today for our viewers and for joining us to celebrate Michigan, where we love to learn about all the great things that make this Mitten State the best. See you next time.